Hello, my name is Eric Stefford, Soils and Composting Manager, and today I'll be running through a Compost 101 for you all. In this presentation, I will cover composting and soil 101, how to make compost, and also composting here at Longwood. So let's get started. First, what is soil? It's a living, complex ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. In that soil, we are building a biological community of interacting organisms in their physical environment, such as you see here. The ecosystem is important, specifically the soil ecosystem, as we begin to relate it to compost. And compost is just the right place to help build that beneficial ecosystem in your soil. Composting, by definition, is the controlled aerobic process that speeds up and converts organic matter into a nutrient-rich soil amendment by providing natural decomposition in an ideal environment for bacteria, fungi, microorganisms, worms, etc. By composting, we are combining organic material and oxygen, supporting a chemical process, and in turn creating a nutrient-rich soil amendment. By supporting and controlling the aerobic and chemical process, we are promoting microbial activity and creating the ideal living complex ecosystem that promotes healthy soil and in turn supports plants, animals, and humans. A higher level of organic matter leads to healthier soils. This in turn improves soil structure, which improves aeration, infiltration of water, and makes it easier for roots to grow. While increasing infiltration of water, it also inversely supports a larger water holding capacity, which is useful in dry periods. High organic matter also holds and releases nutrients in the soil gradually and helps balance and maintain a healthy soil pH. So why do we compost? As mentioned, it helps to promote healthier soil, which improves fruit production and creates an overall healthier ecosystem. Composting is also a sustainable practice. It helps with carbon sequestration, reducing the amount of methane gases released into the atmosphere. It is also a natural fertilizer that holds and releases nutrients into the soil more gradually than synthetic fertilizers. Because of the sustainable aspect of composting, some states and cities have mandated and required composting of food waste. Composting ultimately converts troublesome, difficult to handle material with limited uses to an easily handled material with more uses and creates a valuable material from wasted byproducts. Shown in this diagram, there are a few ways we can create an impact and reduce food waste specifically. By reducing the volume of food waste and green garden waste through the process of composting, we can all help to reduce the impact of climate change. For each wet ton of food scraps composted, there is only 1 20th the volume of carbon dioxide released to the atmosphere as compared to sending that same volume of material to the landfill. So with that, how to make compost. I often refer to making compost is like baking a cake. All chefs are different. Each of us have different recipes and different ingredients at different ratios. The recipe can be rich, lean, or in between as we consider nutrients. It can be half baked and not quite ready for eating, or it can be overcooked, degrading the quality of the finished product. It can cost a little or cost a lot, depending on time, energy, and equipment you put into it. But generally speaking, the fundamental similarities and the biological processes are all the same, whether talking about composting or baking a cake, regardless of scale or technology. There are many things that go into and come out of composting during the entire process. Obviously, going into it, you need waste or discarded organic material that you're looking to break down and turn into something of value. Naturally occurring, you will need air, specifically oxygen, to help fuel the microorganisms that are naturally occurring. And you will also need a good balance of moisture levels, which will help support decomposition. Various things will come out of composting, specifically heat and carbon dioxide are byproducts of microbial activity. The heat will in turn release water as vapor into the air and potentially there will be odors or other gases that will be released as well. The last thing not listed going near your compost is time. This is not an overnight process as it takes time to break down all the materials and produce compost. Organic materials or feedstocks, such as manures, food waste, green or herbaceous garden waste, leaves, and even smaller woody material like wood chips, sticks, and twigs will break down while maybe take a little bit slower. The organic material or the ingredients you have on hand is where composting starts and ultimately creates the biggest impact on your finished product. Each material can be composted alone or together and will take a varying length of time depending on how substantial they are. Your compost needs oxygen. The microbes doing all the work need oxygen. By using oxygen, you are creating a space for aerobic decomposition. You can charge the pile with fresh oxygen through mechanical methods in large operations like ours by using specialized equipment or even a pitchfork digging into and flipping the pile. 
The turning process also helps to redistribute moisture, nutrients, microorganisms throughout the pile, breaking up chunks and voids, and shredding larger particles to a smaller size, increasing the speed at which they will break down. An appropriate moisture level is needed. The compost doesn't want to be too wet or too dry, or it will impact the efficiency at which your microbes are doing their work. Fancy moisture probes can be used to measure your moisture level, specifically to the ideal range of 50 to 65%, but I recommend the snowball method. Most of us have all made a snowball and know what the perfect snowball feels like. Not too dry where it crumbles in your hands while throwing it, and not so wet it creates an ice ball or where you may even squeeze out extra water. Compost is the same. If you take a handful of compost and squeeze it together and it falls apart, it's probably too dry. Alternatively, if you take a handful of compost and squeeze it together and water comes out like a sponge, it's probably too wet. But that perfect snowball or that perfect compost ball that forms indicates an appropriate moisture level. Managing your moisture is a crucial and sometimes overlooked step of the composting process. In certain climates and even seasonally in the dry months throughout the year, not enough moisture can be the issue. I'd recommend starting with high moisture feedstocks if possible and irrigate it with water while turning if it is needed. In other climates or in wet months, too much water may be the issue. I'd recommend turning the pile more frequently to expose wet material to the sun and turning the windrow more frequently to support the release of water vapor. Covers can be a great way to manage moisture by either deflecting rain off the compost or alternatively trapping moisture inside your pile. In both scenarios, creating a large pile will either deflect excess moisture from rainfall but also insulate and retain moisture during dry times. Temperature is important, but not always necessary, depending on your operation or the scale of the composting process. The ideal temperature range within your compost pile is between 140 and 160 degrees. Higher temperatures will help break down the materials faster, but if it gets too hot or above 160 degrees, it will actually have a negative impact on your microbes and decrease composting speed. Temperatures within that range for an extended period of time can help to kill some seeds and pathogens that may be present in your feedstocks. If you notice your compost getting too hot, turn or aerate the pile to disperse some of the heat. Similarly, if your compost isn't quite heating up as well as you should, turn the pile to aerate the pile, adding oxygen back to it, feeding your microorganisms. When in doubt, turn your pile if it's too hot or too cold. Generally speaking, your compost will be hottest within the first three weeks of mixing your ingredients, so no worries if it starts to cool a month or two into the process. That's totally normal. Time is the last factor. Some compost with high management intensities utilizing smaller, more delicate and susceptible feedstocks can be ready in only two months. An example here would be piles turned two to three times per week with materials like lawn clippings that are small and break down quickly. While other compost can take one to two years like piles of more woody material like wood chips and twigs that are turned one to two times a year or even not at all. The speed at which the material breaks down is greatly determined by the amount of work you want to put into it and the materials you are trying to compost. Composting is a science, but a science with a lot of variables. Your desired finished product can be determined by the intended use, the feedstocks you have on hand, the management intensity and temperature thresholds you see. Mother nature and rain or weather events can affect the time at which it takes to compost as well. So at this point, we have gone through how to make compost, and now let's discuss a few different composting methods. As you may have heard me mention previously, there are two main ways that compost is produced. The first is with oxygen or aerobic digestion, which we have discussed mostly, and the second way is anaerobic digestion or without oxygen. Both of these compost methods shown on the screen are passive composting methods, but one would be considered aerobic and the other anaerobic. Both piles require little to no work or effort, both are massive piles that you would leave for an extended period of time, and both take a long time to break down materials. The main difference is that the static pile on the left breaks down materials anaerobically or without oxygen. By not exposing the pile to extra oxygen, the materials would break down very slowly. The passive aerated pile on the right is also left alone, but oxygen is supplied through perforated piping that can be run through the length of the pile, passively allowing some air into the pile, helping break down materials. Both methods are time consuming and require little to no work. During this process, the entirety of the pile will not break down evenly, leaving you with finished compost on the inside that can be difficult to get to. Any material on the outside that doesn't break down can simply be added to a new pile. All three of these are considered aerated or aerobic composting. 
The forced aeration on the left is similar to the previous slide, but air is forced into the pile, increasing the speed of the composting process. While better, it still doesn't mix the materials together and the materials on top won't have broken down as much and can be added to future batches of compost, leaving you finished compost on the bottom for use. The turned aerated pile, which is what we use here at Longwood, is where we turn a pile of compost with a specialized piece of equipment. This can also be done on a smaller scale at home with a pitchfork. This method speeds up the composting process and ensures that all materials break down evenly while also ensuring proper moisture and oxygen is consistent throughout the entire pile. This is one of the most common methods of backyard composting as it can be scaled up and down. The last on the right is a turned aerated agitated bed. In this method, substantial infrastructure and equipment is needed and is only common in very large operations. In this method, air is forced in from the bottom and also the piles are turned frequently. The pros for all three of these methods, they're more reliably aerobic, there's good process and product control, and shorter composting times. But the cons for all three methods require infrastructure and equipment. Next, we have in-vessel or contain methods. You may be familiar with some of the kitchen countertop composting devices on the market these days, and the diagram here is very similar to that process. This is a turnkey composting system that can make it very easy to compost and can be implemented at the scale starting with your kitchen counter and even as large as tractor trailers. The pros in this system that there can be many configurations and sizes, very good process control, it's a turnkey package, low labor and low area requirements. The cons for this system is that it can have a high upstart cost and it does require electricity. So now let's touch on composting here at Longwood. First, the soils and composting team collects green material or green garden waste and other compostable materials, including plant material, grass clippings, and seasonal displays from multiple locations throughout the campus. Horse manure is collected from three local horse farms, which gets used in the creation of our compost windrows. Leaves are collected each fall and deposited here on the leaf wharf. Some leaves are composted on their own and used as a garden bed cover, but we also use the leaves directly in our composting process. Initially, the three products are loaded equally by weight into the coon mixer you see hooked up to the New Holland tractor here. With the augers inside the coon mixing the materials together, the operator opens the chutes and turns on the conveyor belt beginning the discharge of the mixed ingredients. As the materials discharges, it piles up higher and higher. We keep letting it pile up until it reaches the maximum height of the conveyor, approximately four to five feet. Once to the maximum height of the conveyor, the operator begins to drive forward, slowly discharging more material in a long straight line. The operator then keeps moving until the mixer is empty or until the windrow has reached a desired length. Most windrows are approximately 75 feet in length and require approximately 12 loads in the mixer to make one batch. After the windrow is completed, it usually looks something like this. At this point, aerobic interactions within the windrow begin to form and the pile starts cooking. It will then be put into daily monitoring. Each day the compost is checked for temperatures, which will determine the schedule for routine turning. The compost can typically be turned more than 10 times before it is released to the gardens as a finished product. Each windrow is monitored individually for temperature and oxygen levels, which will indicate if it needs to be turned. At 160 degrees, the windrows are turned to dissipate heat and add oxygen, rejuvenating the microbes and aerobic breakdown within each windrow. The turnaround from creation of a windrow to cured, screened, finished compost can vary depending on weather. The primary weather factor that goes into the frequency of turning is ambient air temperature affecting the temperature of the pile. For example, compost made over the winter has a harder time reaching temperature due to the low temperatures affecting microbial activity, and summer compost might be turned more often to keep the temperature from going above 160 degrees. Here is our temperature probe that we use in the daily monitoring of the windrows. Here, you can see our windrows out on the wharf on a summer morning a couple years ago. They are obviously cooking nicely, given how much steam is coming off of them. After the compost has finished its cooking process, it is then put through our screener and screened to a 5 8 of an inch size to remove larger particles or impurities that may not have broken down entirely. By doing this, it also creates a more uniform, finer particle size finished product, which works much better for the end user. This also removes any trash that may have gone into the compost from the feedstocks we use to make it. The finished compost is then put in a pile and is ready for garden use after we receive the results from compost testing. As you can see above, the results come in the form of a compost technical data sheet. Samples are shipped on ice overnight to a third party testing agency. They will test for bulk density, pH, a full suite of nutrient loading, fecal coliform, heavy metals, and have gone through germination trials. 
Through the intense management of our compost, and specifically through this rigorous testing process, we have been creating U.S. Compost Council certified compost since 2022. Our compost is even available in the garden shop for purchase. And finally, now that we know all about composting, let's talk about how you can begin composting at home. As shown before, here is a passive static pile or a compost heap. Simply pile all food scraps, lawn clippings, leaves, garden waste, and other organic materials in a large pile and let it sit for probably close to a year, if not longer, depending on the size of the pile. You can continue to pile material on top throughout the year. The pros for this certainly is that it's easy to do and requires little to no effort to make, while it does require some effort to reach the finished compost on the bottom. Simply use the unbroken down material on the outside to start your next compost heap as you dig down to get to your finished compost. A round wire bin is another common home composting method. This makes it easier to pile up all your materials and keeps them enclosed preventing some wildlife from getting in. This also provides a little bit of passive aeration as it's easier for oxygen to permeate in from all sides. It can be difficult to get to the finished compost out of the bottom digging in from the top, so simply push over the full wire bin and all the finished compost should fall out of the bottom. Then stand the wire cage back up and keep adding your feedstocks to the cage starting the process over. A three bin turning unit is a larger method for at home composting. While a little bit more of a DIY build, this allows more storage and use of feedstocks. One bin on the left is used for active composting. This is where you pile all your fresh greens and food waste. The middle bin is for storage of leaves or wood chips. This way you have something to put on top of the fresh ingredients, making layers to your cake, preventing wildlife from getting into your scraps. Then the final bin is for finished compost from the year before, or alternatively, where you will start your next batch of compost. A tumbler is another method for at-home composting. These are great for smaller material volumes and actually offer great means of turning and aerating your compost as materials are added, ensuring materials break down evenly. Composting can be a rewarding and impactful process as you look to grow veggies for your family or beauty in your personal space. Thank you.